We're going to jump straight in. We have the rest of Ezra chapter 7 today. Um, I have forewarned you about some long stretches. Today is not exactly one of those long stretches, but it's not far off, so prepare your knees. But go ahead and stand with me if you are able. We stand to honor the reading of God's Word. We'll be looking at Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 down through 28. Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 down through 28. When I conclude reading, you'll hear me, hear me affirm, this is the Word of the Lord. I encourage you, please respond with, thanks be to God. Starting in verse 11, hear now the Word of the living God. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra, the priest, the scribe, a man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra, the priest, the scribe of the law and the God of heaven, peace. And now I make a decree that anyone of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you were sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and also to carry the silver and gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, with all the silver and gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia, and with the freewill offerings of the people and the priests, vowed willingly for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money, then, you shall, with all diligence, buy bulls, rams, lambs, and with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you and your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold you may do according to the will of your God. The vessels that have been given to you for the service of the house of your God you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever else is required for the house of your God, which it falls to you to provide, you may provide it out of the king's treasury. And I, Artaxerxes the king, Make a decree to all the treasurers in the province beyond the river. Whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, requires of you, let it be done with all diligence, up to a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred cores, excuse me, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. Whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of the God of heaven, lest his wrath be against the realm of the king and his sons. We also notify you that it shall not be lawful to impose tribute, custom, or toll on any one of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the temple servants, or other servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God. And those who do not know them you shall teach. Whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage, for the hand of the Lord my God was on me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord God, bless the preaching and teaching of your word this morning, God. Would you incline our ears and our hearts to you? And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. few things to walk through this morning, and no, I'm not going to latch on to that part about the priests and Levites not paying taxes and say that's why pastors ought not pay taxes either. That's, that's not going to be the message for this morning, but there's several dynamics going on in this passage that are interesting. We're going to pick out a few of them. Um, the first one is, who is this king of kings that we read about? We've been encountering our Xerxes now for a few chapters, but I want to refresh us where we are. So Ezra, the prophet, has returned now to the land. Um, this is in the second wave of return from Babylonian exile. They've been cast out. They've been there for generations. Now they're coming back, and Ezra coming back in this second wave. And there's sort of a renewal that's going on in our passage specifically. Um, Ezra's being sent, in essence, to set things right, to, to set things in order, to see what's not being done, to see what needs to be done, and to go on from there. And much of this has, has to do with following the king in his kingdom. There's going to be a big dynamic in this, uh, this message today about the king and his kingdom. You, you, you heard the warnings last week 
that, that very vitriolic warning of the, the timber being removed from your house and you being impaled and your house being turned into a hill of dung. If you're a visitor, I encourage you. I didn't make that up. It's actually in the, the last chapter, or the earlier in this chapter, rather. But you have warnings here too, right? Do these things and live. Do these things and avoid punishment. If you step out of line, there will be consequences. There will be punishment. It's the rules of the king within his kingdom. Artaxerxes has the right to do this. They are still within the Persian Empire. He's setting consequences. And specifically, he's saying there's consequences for disobeying the king's law. He has a law. It's codified. It's set down in stone or, you know, clay tablet in this case. But you disobey the law, you don't get to be in the kingdom. Did you notice deportation was still threatened there? You, you obey these laws, you may get a fine, you may get something worse, you may even get executed, or you may just get booted out of the kingdom. The point is, to live in the kingdom of the king, you must obey the king's laws. It's pretty straightforward. We're, we're familiar with this sort of things. But I want you to consider how this has gone for people throughout Scripture. Us, and of course I'm talking about God now, not King Artaxerxes, but us living within the kingdom of the king and consistently failing to live by the king's laws in that kingdom. And there's, a, there's an interesting geographical dynamic that is at play here. Let me, let me explain what I mean. If you think back to the garden, you have Genesis 1 and 2, Adam and Eve created by God. They're living in the Garden of Eden. They're obeying God's laws right up until chapter 3. It doesn't take them long. But when they sin in chapter 3, they're cast out, and they're cast out in a certain direction, eastward, eastward from Eden, right? Cast out, and they're, in essence, sent into an exile, from the place that God had prepared for them, from the place that God had established his rule and reign, they're cast eastward out into an exile, period. Going east is synonymous with going into exile. If you think of Israel's history, you see that same dynamic mirrored many, many times. Israel, and I'm thinking now back to when they got deported to Babylon in the first place, Israel had forsaken their God, they had forsaken God's kingdom, and in in consequence for that, God takes that kingdom away. He takes the temple away. He strips their land away. And in essence, he removes his presence from them. And where are they cast? Eastward. Again, into exile. Go into Babylon and wait for, wait for me to bring you back. Again, going east means exile and death. And here we've got Ezra and he's making a journey, but which way is he going? West. He's coming from the east in the land of exile, but now he's coming west. And his journey is much different than those two I just described. His is a journey of coming back to the land of promise, back to the things that God had promised to his people, back to the temple, back to the worship, back to the festivals. This is a journey of returning to what God has given and specifically to what God's restoring to his people. And this return is going to be anchored in something that's very vital. It's not a free willing, I'm going to set my own course. It's anchored in the word of God and specifically the law word of God. Just as an aside, if, if you were to think centuries after Ezra, many centuries down the road, we celebrate every Christmas this story of wise men coming from Persia, from this same land, this whole ge geographical dynamic, once again, traveling westward, traveling back, beckoned by a star to see a Christ child that was born in a manger. I find that so intriguing because through Christ, the church has been given a wondrous task calling God's people to return to him, calling God's people home from exile, calling God's people to forsake the ways of the land and to instead seek his kingdom, dare I say, as Christ said, on earth as it is in heaven. This is the call of the church. In other words, and this is one thing I want to try to connect here in Ezra, this is our story too. This is your story too. We're not reading about a bygone era. This is part of your story, Christian. We'll get there, don't worry. We've got lots of time this morning. We're going to feed you afterwards so we get to keep you longer. If you were to think back last week, we encountered Ezra, um, the prophet and scribe. He's traveling across the hot desert uh, in the middle of summer, which I think gets him extra points. But he's kind of in the role of a sort of new Moses. If you were to think of Moses' legacy, Ezra in many ways is doing what Moses did. He's bringing God's law back to God's people, returning them from exile, and planting them on a sure and firm foundation, specifically what God has said. Today's passage, we got this recording of Artaxerxes' letter that is sent to Ezra, that in essence is sending Ezra back to Jerusalem. And you can probably tell from the end, it's going to get a little confusing because Ezra just lapses into first person. Did you catch that at the end of the chapter? He'll record something, and then he'll kind of give his commentary on it. That's going to continue to happen in the, the following chapters. But this is King Artaxerxes sending him back to check on things. Go back, see what your people have been up to, set things right as needed, make sure everything's in order, and then you've got the big bonus of what? I'm going to foot the bill, which is quite the plus and quite the turnaround for God's people. 
from exile and slavery in Persia, now to go back, I will fund it. We're going to get to why he does that. Actually, we're going to get to it right now. If you, if you were to hear that, if you were to hear that and think, ah, Artaxerxes is sending him back, he's setting it right, and he's in fact saying, hey, you bring God's law back to God's people, you might think this is altruism. You might think this is sort of selfless, philanthropical behavior on Artaxerxes' part. He's being a real stand-up guy. That's what it seems like at first glance, doesn't it? Don't miss this. Artaxerxes wants what every king wants, stability. He wants stability, specifically within his empire. If you were to look back, Egypt in this time period had just recently rebelled. I mentioned early on in this series, Egypt is kind of a troublemaker in the region. They just kind of have a lot of political, geopolitical conflicts. But within a couple of years, right before this chapter, they had had a rebellion. So a strong but submissive Israel, acting as a sort of geopolitical buffer there, would make a really nice military advantage for King Artaxerxes. It's in, his, it's in his good favor to have Israel strong enough to repel Egyptian rebellions, but submissive enough that they're going to stay in line to stabilize the region, in essence. I'm not trying to just strip him of all his goodwill, but I'm just saying this is not altruism. He's got a plot behind this. He's trying to stabilize this area of his kingdom. And I think he also might have recognized God's law brings stability. Because he tells him to bring the law back, which is interesting. God's law brings stability, and it has an undeniable stabilizing effect on any society that honors it. God's law has that effect. We spoke about that last week, but this is what I want to push in on a little bit here. God's law, though, is not neutral. It's not a neutral law. In other words, whatever King Artaxerxes may have thought of God's law, Ezra knows God's law is not something we use or bend to our will or institute when it's convenient to us. God's law is not neutral in that regard. Instead, God's law demands obedience. It demands obedience of all that hear it, including earthly powers, including Artaxerxes. That's going to be important because the application of God's law will always and inevitably lead to conflict. Not stability, as Artaxerxes may presume, but conflict when earthly rulers and powers reject that law. This is one of the reasons why we walked through Psalm 2 in a sermon before we jumped into Ezra. Psalm 2 is rich with this language. We'll get back to that a little later, but let's look at the text a little more. Verse 12, Artaxerxes introduces himself. He says, Artaxerxes, king of kings. And if you're attuned to your Bible, your hackles go up and you've got the, the spidey sense already going off. Let, let's give him a little bit of credit here. This is a common title and specifically for Persian kings in particular. Many Persian kings took this title on themselves. I'm not excusing them. Don't throw things at me. Um, but many kings, if you were to think through history, many kings have taken these grandiose titles, king of kings, even lord of lords. It, it feels terrible to even put those two together, and it should. But if you were to look back, Plutarch, who was a first century Greek philosopher, he observed this title, this king of kings title, was probably better than his reported nickname, which was the long-handed so we will henceforth refer to Artaxerxes as Artaxerxes the long-handed. Apparently his right hand was longer than his left. <laughs> this is why I point this out. It may be a better nickname, but it's not going to work out well for Artaxerxes to claim a title that only the God of the universe can claim. Whether he believes in that God or not, that has nothing to do with it. Um, there's two pictures I wanted to show you. This is the Behistun inscription, and it's a relief carved into a cliff face do we have that pit? Yeah. So that right there is where it's carved in, and that's at a 330-foot elevation, and it's in modern-day western Iran, okay, or Iran, rather. But this is telling the story of King Darius, who you guys remember well, quelling a rebellion. Not this Egyptian rebellion that I referred to, but one that was very similar. He quells the rebellion. They carve this into the cliff face. You can see the man down there. I'm trying to just, I'm trying to kind of paint this picture a little more for us. But Darius there is pictured trampling on the body of defeated kings. I think we have a picture, yes. So you, I don't know if you can make that out or not, but that's King Darius pictured stomping on defeated kings and leading his satraps, his kind of governors, his, his underlings, in line as prisoners. And it includes a description of the event. None of us in this room will be able to probably read this, but let me tell you what this, this inscription says. It says, King Darius, the great king, king of kings, king in Persia, king of the countries. That's the inscription. So I point all this out not only to give a little bit of a feel for what we're looking at, but also this is a very common title of kings of that area. Now you may ask, if it's common, why is it such a bad idea to claim this title? 
He's obviously claiming he's the king over lesser kings. He's got a big old empire with lots of defeated kings. Like, we get that part, but it's missing the point. God, and only God, is the king of kings and can only be the king of kings. Three scriptures that came to mind. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul speaks of he who is the blessed and only sovereign. Do you catch that? Blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords. Similarly, John in the Revelation, not Revelations, as social media has been saying all week this week, purge that S. John in the Revelation in chapter 17 says, they will make war on the lamb and lamb will conquer them for he, speaking of Christ the lamb, is the Lord of lords and king of kings and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Paul again in Philippians chapter 2, therefore God has highly exalted him, speaking of Christ, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I bring these up, and again, this might be uh, very obvious territory for many of us, but in other words, I bring this up because it's foundational that we recognize there is only one King of Kings ever. There's only one sovereign. There is only one king who is over all kings. Rulers of this world may like to claim those titles, but we must be clear in our thinking on these issues. And I would dare to say it might give us some inclination into where those rulers come from when they claim such titles. In other words, believe people when they say things. That's just on a side note. But when we say God is king, what we are confessing is he is the ruler of all. And if he is the ruler of all, the king of kings, every other ruler is subservient to him derivative of him, serving at his behest, under his sovereignty. That means the world's authorities exercise what is called derivative authority. It's a derived authority. It's an authority that is given and granted to them. They operate with God's permission, but what we covered in Psalm 2 is they must submit to him as king. In other words, God doesn't just give something that we can run off with. God says, here is authority, now submit to me and obey my law. Further, did you notice how often this concept of kings, kingship, even in those passages we just read, is connected with sovereignty? King of kings, the one and only sovereign. Th there's a key reason for that. The king of kings does as he pleases. Very foundational. And we've been walking through this much in Ezra, but this is foundational. What is God saying when he says he's the king of kings? He's saying that within his kingdom, which is all of creation, he does everything and anything that he pleases. He is sovereign. In other words, well, I would point this out. It, it may sound like I'm only talking about kings when I speak of these things or rulers that are in authority. And we may be getting comfortable in church today because you say, well, I'm not a king. I'm not a ruler. Neither is Josh. That's okay. We can relax on this one. Don't miss this, brothers and sisters. We do this in our hearts. We do this in our hearts. Artaxerxes may have stood on a throne and said, I'm the king of kings, but brothers and sisters, we have the propensity to do this in our own hearts. And you know it as well as I do, to set ourselves on a throne that God says only he can occupy. So don't dismiss yourselves from this equation, nor I from this equation. But I thought this was quite interesting. Following this claim of king of kings, what does Artaxerxes kind of extend to them there in verse 12? If you're, if you're looking for memory verses in the Bible, this one sentence is pretty, pretty solid because it's only one word, peace, right? Peace. And I'm not exactly sure if he's declaring peace or if he's extending the offer of peace, but, but either way, it's quite common for a ruler to extend peace or to declare peace to his subjects, right? In other words, hey, I'm Artaxerxes, I'm writing to you, don't worry, I'm not coming with executions, I'm not going to burn the whole place down, peace, now let me get to the point, right? So that's, that's somewhat common, but peace sounds pretty nice. Peace sounds quite comforting, especially since there's, there's rarely times that we see peace seemingly reigning in this world. If I was to ask you, do we live in peaceful days? I doubt any Christian in human history would say yes. Well, of course we don't live in peaceful days. Peace does not seem to be reigning in this world. There's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's these things that seem to swirl, and they seem to kind of recur quite often. So where does true peace come from? Artaxerxes is extending it, or declaring it even. There's peace. Yet those subjects know as well as he does, there's not peace. They're about to be picking up swords as they're building a wall. There's not peace in their day. Where does true peace come from? And it comes only in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We've got to be real clear on our thinking here, and this is going to set up where we're going in some following chapters. You may be thinking of Christ's words in John 16, He said, I have said these things to you that in me, he says, you will have peace. 
In the world, you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Are you, are you hearing that king language? I have stomped the world. I am the king. I'm the only one in whom you will find peace. And notice here, that's peace for his children. That's peace for those who follow the king. That's important for us to notice. And Scripture speaks quite often about this peace of Christ. I'm going to run through these in quick order because we're in a time crunch this morning. But John 14, we read that it's Christ's peace which he gives to us and leaves with us for his children. We also read in Colossians chapter 3, the peace of Christ is supposed to rule in our hearts and it's supposed to rule in our fellowship. That's what we spoke of with the Lord's Supper a moment ago. 1 Corinthians 14, God is described as the God of peace, the one who brings peace, the one who is peace. Hebrews chapter 12, we read that this peace is something we should strive for and live under. It's a peace we are to pursue, 1 Peter 3 and Psalm 34. It's also a peace in which we rest. What does peace feel like? It is like a pillow for our weary heads. That's in Psalm 4. But it's also a perfect peace for those who trust in God. And it surpasses all of our understanding, Isaiah 26 and Philippians 4. And there's many, many more. If you were to go home and just do a word search in your Bible of what peace looks like, there's so much to say here. But what sort of picture is this of peace? Artaxerxes extending peace, us realizing only true peace comes through God and submission to him. This is the picture. Scripture paints this picture of volatile conflict. It's one in which our sin, in our sin, we are at war against God. Not lost in the forest, but raging in battle against the king of the universe. This is the picture that scripture paints of us in our sin, in our fallen state. And we even fight against ourselves. No one in this room has wronged you more than you have. This is the, this is the reality of sin. We wound ourselves in our rebellion against God. Fighting against God's rule, or dare I say, fighting against God's law, is our, is our uh, state in sin. In other words, we're people in conflict Constant conflict from Genesis 3 on that are in desperate need of peace, rule, law, comfort that comes through that. That's why when we speak of God's peace, that peace of God must extend into every facet of our lives. Not just church house, not just Sunday, not just that was a really interesting passage. The rule of God and the peace it brings must press into all our lives. And that's important because without Christ, we have no peace. Without Christ, there's no way forward. You could think of this on kind of a geopolitical la uh, level. Obviously, there is, there is conflict in the, the world right now. There's conflict still in Russia, Ukraine. There's conflict in Israel and Hamas. But if you were to think back, every time a conflict breaks out, what do people speak of? Peace. We all look at those things, and, and whatever we might argue about with those things, we all recognize one thing. Peace sounds good. We want peace to extend to those conflicts. And yet we have absolutely no direction of how to reach it. This is the story of social media, isn't it? Peace, yes. How to get there? Rawr. Then we argue about it, right? We know peace is good. We're not quite sure how to get there. And I would dare say every ruler speaks about peace. Adolf Hitler spoke a lot about peace. Speaking of peace does very little because there's a problem with the world's peace. There's a real problem with the peace of the world, including this peace that Artaxerxes extends. And this is it. It doesn't last, which means it's not true peace. There, there's this fascinating part. I can't let a sermon slip without referring to World War I or II, but I'll, I'll, I'll change it up. I'll go back to World War I. There was something famously called the, the Christmas truce. Are you familiar with the Christmas truce, anybody? Okay. One of the oddest things in modern warfare, I think, um, where you've got these hardened lines of trench warfare some of the most gruesome fighting of the modern era, and yet you have this, this one time where uh, two battalions, one of Germans and one of Welsh from uh, Great Britain, play a game of football. They, they lay down their guns for a moment, they have a game of football, and it's fascinating. There's lots of intrigue into how exactly this, this panned out and why it didn't pan out in the future. But the point is this. They come out, they play a game of football, and they observe peace for Christmas time. And then what do they have to do after that peace is over? They go back to stabbing one another and shooting one another. It's not actual peace. And that's what makes that scene so tragic, is you can see photographs of these men standing on a battlefield playing football and smiling, and you know they're going to go to murdering each other the very next day, or excuse me, killing one another in warfare the very next day. It's tragic because it's not true peace. If anything, we could call it an armistice. We could call it a temporary laying down of arms, but we can't say that was any sort of peace. And there's a reason for that. 
in any place in human history, in any place in the cosmos that God has created, people only experience true peace, whether that's on a battlefield, whether it's in your own heart, which is in turmoil because of sin, whether it's within your own family, Christian, brother and sister, whether it's within the society we find ourselves, we will only and anywhere see true peace when they, we submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, in me, and only in me, do you find true peace. We've got to move on, but please hear me here, because I don't want this point to be missed. We are following in the footsteps of Artaxerxes when we reject God's sovereignty as king in all of life. Are you hearing me on this one? When we say God is king, but not really, when we say he reigns, but not so much, when we allow rebellion to percolate within our own hearts, within our own families, within our own church, within our own society, we're following in the footsteps of Artaxerxes who extended a man-made, transient, non-substantial peace that will not last. Peace in our heart, peace in our homes and in our marriages, peace among our people and our society, we must have Christ as Lord, which means that we must have Christ as Lord and we must obey his law word. We must observe, in other words, the authority of the king. A tip of the cap to God as king does us no good. We have to follow him as king. Only in him do we find true peace. Let's get to our second point, and I'm going to start talking a lot faster. Here we go. How are God's people then provided for? Let's look at verses 13 down through 24. So Artaxerxes makes this decree, and he says, Anyone who would like to return to the land may do so, which is, which is generous of him. He's got a kingdom to manage. Anyone who would like to return, do so, and you'll be provided for. And we can all back up and remember, exile is a messy business, right? There's people scattered all over the place. This is, not, this is not a very orderly thing. But he says, go back, I'll provide for you. And he gives them quite a bit of money, quite a bit of money. It's not exactly a blank check, uh, but it's a truly substantial sum. If you were to think of that whole uh, land beyond the river um, that, uh, that, the, that they have been uh, dealing with and that opposition has been r arising from, that entire region, he essentially gives them about a third of the wealth of that region in this one act. So it's quite a substantial sum that he sends them with. And he doesn't stipulate how they're to buy the animals or the offerings. He, he gives them, in essence, leeway to do as they must to follow God. We see that in verse 18. He says, whatever seems good to you and your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold, you may do according to the will of your God. That's shocking language for a pagan king, isn't it? Whatever your God directs you to do, you do so. I don't know the laws as well as you do. You follow God in the way he's called you to. So what sort of gathering together is this then when Ezra gets there? Because there's a lot going on. You've got Ezra returning. You've got checking on their spiritual vitality. He's checking on the temple modifications. What is it looking like? There's some old men weeping because they saw the first temple. Let's deal with that. Um, he's setting officials in order, you know, sort of governmental representatives. But this is about something much bigger than just those kind of odds and ends. This isn't, in other words, an administrative setting where good administration and just moving the right pieces around, this is what's really driving the passage. I don't think that's what's happening. Ezra's return is a time of God continuing to gather his covenant people to himself. This is, in other words, about God having a people whom he has called and providing for them. And this is a theme that's quite prominent in the Old Testament. God's people are defined as those who are in covenant with God. So you get clear dynamics. There's an undeniable and an obvious ethnic dynamic going on in our passage, primarily since it includes, that covenant includes their children after them, that is to say their families. So there's some homogeneity going on, but it's important to remember their families are gathered because of covenant. Are you, are you following me on this one? God's not calling a race to himself. God's calling a covenanted people to himself. And that makes all the difference in understanding, especially what we're going to wade through in the following chapters. In other words, when I said at the beginning of the sermon that this is where we see ourselves in the story, I think this is where we see ourselves in this story. This is why Christians, when we read Ezra, when we read Nehemiah, we're not reading a story of another people. We're reading our story. It's the story of God's covenanted people, not some sort of woe-begone Old Testament story. This is a story about God's calling of a people to himself, which is why every one of us in this room is gathered here today in identification with the, with the God of the universe you see this play out in the, the New Testament. Peter calls the church a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, God's people. You find that in 1 Peter chapter 2. All titles, by the way, that describe this Old Testament people of God that we're reading about here in Ezra. 
And likewise, Paul emphasizes that Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile. We get that beautiful language and promise in Ephesians chapter 2, and later goes so far as to call the church the Israel of God. That's in Galatians 6.16. There's a reason the New Testament looks at it that way. It's because those who were in covenant were always called to be a people of faith. God calls a people to himself and sets them aside. They're separate from the world around them, and he calls them, respond in faith to me. Grab hold of the promise that has been extended in which you have been called. Consider Paul's words in Romans chapter 2. He said, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter. This is important for us. The people being gathered in Ezra are not just being gathered as a physical people. They're being gathered as a spiritually bonded people to God. And this makes all the difference. We get this further from Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. He said, Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. Who are those who are sons of Abraham in Ezra? Those who have faith in the God of promise. Who today are the sons of Abraham, those who have faith in the the God of promise? That is a magnificent blessing that God has extended through Christ. And this is who Ezra is calling back to the land. It's God's people of faith, along with their children after them, to whom the promise had been given. Why does all that matter? Why walk through that with such short time on my timer that I'm now observing? Why does this matter? This, This matters a lot. Number one, it answers the what is this to me question. What hath Ezra to do with Josh in 2023 has everything to do with you. If you are in Christ, this is your story. This is the story of God's redemption of his people. This is your story, and this is where we find our people in this story. So back to our text. We see that the king's a bit wary of this God of the Hebrews. We see that in verse 23. He says, whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the God of heaven for the house of the God of heaven, excuse me, lest his wrath be against the realm of the king and his sons. Which is quite an interesting term. So the king of one of the mightiest empires in the, in the modern world, well, in the world at that time, rather, asked for prayer. Pray to your God. Appreciate this. This is the king of Persia. Pray to your God. And specifically, he says, pray to your God, lest maybe that wrath come off onto me and onto my progeny, my sons. What are we to make of that sort of thing? Is this a legitimate prayer request? It might be. Maybe Artaxerxes has a glimpse there. Maybe he has an inkling that something is different about this people and about the God that they, that they follow. I, I would say we can be hopeful, although this people is pretty small, pretty insignificant. This is roughly, again, the returning party is less than the population of Battle Creek. It's a small group, and yet maybe he sees something a little different at work here. But I would point out here, there's a psalm, again, Psalm 2, that tells us that the rulers of the world must submit to Christ, and it comes with a little bit more. It says, lest he dash them to pieces with a rod of iron. I wonder if Artaxerxes might have, might have known some of those things. I wonder if he might have heard some of these things. It's clear he has Jewish advisors. This letter is very well crafted. It's very well put together. He, like any other great ruler, has people informing him of the, the laws and customs of the Jews. I wonder if he had an inkling that this God was different. I would dare say this should be pretty formative for how Christians today engage in public witness, that we boldly and fearlessly proclaim every knee must bow before Christ. Every knee must bow, including including the leaders and rulers in this world. We're not Christian Gnostics. We don't believe in some sort of radical bifurcation between the sacred and the secular. God's kingdom touches down here. I call you to submit, and we call every man and woman under heaven to submit to the king. But accordingly, you've got Artaxerxes appointing Ezra to employ these magistrates and judges. So he starts doing the administrative job. He's setting these men in line. And the implication seems quite clear. To know how to judge properly, that is to say, to know how to judge in a godly manner, in a God-honoring manner, they need to know God's law. Did he catch that? Several times he made clear, set them in order, have them judge, and according to God's law. Why would he say that? Because only by God's law can we judge properly. And I'm not talking about the law that's written on every human heart because Romans 1 makes quite clear that we suppress that truth and unrighteousness. We need something tangible, something that cuts through the hard calluses of our human hearts. God's law word, he's saying, administer through that. The Westminster Confession in in chapter 23 says it this way quite beautifully. It says, God, the supreme Lord and King of all the world, hath ordained civil magistrates to be under him over the people 
for his own glory and for the public good. So in other words, God ordained civil magistrates, and on that we all agree, but this is what I'm pressing in on. Those magistrates must serve him. And I think on that we should all agree. Any ruler, power, and authority in this world is called to bow before God's law as normative for this world, for what God has created. To fail to do so is to reject the God who is over them. But who does the law apply to? Let's press in a little bit on this. Verse 26, who does the law apply to? Verse 26 says, Whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. Let me pause there for a minute because we spoke quite a bit about the law last week. The law is good. The law applies to all of God's creation. Even King Artaxerxes is called to submit. But what about the details here? What about the details? I've got in your, if you've got the sermon discussion guide, in the notes I have, God is in the details. It's an old German proverb, tip of the cap to the Germans, um, an old German proverb, which is God is in the details, which is much better than the way we say it, which is what? The devil's in the details. No, he's not. (laughs) God's in the details. But what happens when God's law is implemented and people just obey it out of road obedience, but their heart is not following him? I think this is a good question. This is usually where Christians struggle. I'm with you on the law. I hear it's a good thing. We honor God's law, but what if we call God's people to obey God's law, but their hearts aren't really in it? Is that not sin? Will that not lead to judgment? And Israel has good reason to ask this. What were they doing to get booted into Babylonian exile in the first place? Many of them obeying outwardly and yet not obeying with their heart. And this this threat of combining the things of God with the things of the world, this is something that they have gone through before, and this is something we have gone through before as well. There's this hilariously tragic example, um, and I'll be, I'll be quite brief, but there's this humongous cathedral that was built outside of Paris to celebrate a St. Denis, okay? Uh, kings of France were even buried there. This was a massive cathedral, but its history is a prime example of this whole combining the things of God with the things of this world. It was built over the shrine of a pagan god, which the, the pagan god's name was Dionysus. The locals simply took the name of Dionysus and replaced it with Dennis and made up this nice story of a St. Dennis. Subsequent generations forgot about it. Those that came later told this story of a St. Dennis, Dennis, who was a third century bishop of Paris. He was beheaded tragically for his faith, all this false. And yet miraculously, he picked up his beheaded head, walked 10 miles, and where he dropped it on the house or on the ground, this is where they built the cathedral. The cathedral to St. Dennis. And yet nothing of that is true. This is why I bring that up. It is very easy for Christians, as in Ezra's day, what is he warning them about? Don't combine the things of God with the things of the world. And further, don't forget where you came from. Remember last week, we don't want novelty. We don't want you trying to invent some new ways and making up a St. Dennis story. No, no, no. Hold fast to God's law word as he has led us. Don't do the new things that combine with the world. And how do we encounter this within American Christianity? We don't have a cathedral to St. Dennis But American Christianity, brothers and sisters, does this all the time. All the time. We have worldly practices and beliefs that are rampant in the church. And what is the only thing that I can latch on to? I'm thinking back to last week. To explain it, it's been there long enough. 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and everybody's forgotten. How did we start teaching these things in the church? I could get off on a a tangent there. We've got to move to the third point. Lunch is waiting. What we're we're, uh, talking about here, though, is how to correctly address authority in this world. And I would just point out with this, we not throw the baby out with the bathwater, okay? God's law is good. Submission to God is normative for all of his creation, commanded, in fact, of all of his creation. Have there been abuses within the church? Yes. What do we do? We purge that from among us. If we're doing things we ought not be, we want to address those things. But this is what we mean when we confess that God is sovereign, means he's sovereign within the church house, within my home. My family has practices which are not in accordance with God's word. We purge those as well. And this is Ezra's message to every authority in the world, including those that God is setting up here in Jerusalem. He says, follow God and live. That's Ezra's message, essentially, that he's returning to them with. Third thing, we'll wrap this one up quickly, I promise. Third thing, how will they know God's ways? I saved this for last. It's going to be the shortest by far. But this is the most important, I think, in this little passage. How will they know God's ways? And if you look at verses 27 and 28, Ezra breaks into a sort of doxology. Paul did not invent the doxology. Ezra was doxologizing long before Paul got here. 
three of you are amused by that. That's okay. I'm not here for you guys. I'm just here to amuse myself. What does he do? First, he recognizes God. This is his doxology. I recognize God, the covenant God, the God of our fathers, including uh, of Ezra. But then second, he says something that would make a lot of American Christians shiver. Praise the God of heaven who did what? Put this thing into the heart of the king. Put this thing into the heart of the king. Brothers and sisters, this is one area in which we've got to get biblical thinking in our heads within the church. Because it's an interesting state of things where many Christians would find this confusing and offensive that God puts something into the heart of the king or anyone else for that matter. But I would, I would encourage you, God has no such reservations and scripture has no such reservations that God grabs hold of hearts and molds them to his will. And for any of us who are Christians who approach this table, we should say, praise God he does. Praise God he got a hold of my heart and has wrenched the sin from it and is continuing to do so and molding it into something beautiful that will glorify him. Praise God he has no such reservations. But that's why this passage is so comforting. That's why this passage is so comforting that God shapes and molds the hearts of men and kings to his sovereign will. And this is why Ezra takes courage. Did you see what Ezra proclaims? For the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. What did he do with the king? He put something into his heart to enforce his will. What does he do to Ezra? His loving hand on his servant, molding his heart as well. There was this, this, this one time that I had, a, I had bad tooth pain, and I fought it for a few months. My dentist applauded my, my toughness, just so you all know. I'm quite tough with tooth pain. Um, it was killing me for forever. And I finally went to the dentist, and it was an abscess tooth, and so they had to do like an emergency root canal. So you've got this really interesting story, and it'd be a shame not to use it as a sermon illustration because it's so good, right? It just preaches itself. You've got a tooth that looks perfect. He showed it to me. It looked great. I'd been brushing that tooth like, I mean, like nobody's business. It was well brushed and taken care of. It was dead. And not only was it dead, well, I'm not going to get graphic, there was a rot inside of it that would have extended into my jaw and can kill you, right? Like it's a serious thing. It's not just a, just a like laugh, laughing matter. And to me, that tooth was crippling. I, I could not, at the time they finally did the surgery, I couldn't drive a car. I was, I was crippled. My head was killing me. It hurt to stand up. It was painful. It could have even been deadly. The reason I point that out is, in Ezra's day, he is encountering a people of God that look quite good. You got the temple built, you're calling the people back to worship, you're doing the things. What's the danger? They might be a tooth with rod inside. So what is he coming back to do? Remember the law word of God. Found yourself on God's law word. Do not repeat the mistakes of the past. Learn from the past and treasure what God has given you. If we're applying this to the church today, we can say easily, there are things that creep into church quite frequently. There's false teachings. There's just unsound practices, things we just probably should not be doing. There's the neglect of things that we should be treasuring within the church. This creeps into the church so frequently, and many of these things build from our, la our sermon last week. They're novelties. A brief perusal of Christian history will reveal the American church does many things that are quite foreign to the history of Christianity. Ezra here, in closing, I promise, Ezra here is reminding us the way forward is really clear and it's really hopeful. God's people being called back to him. They're not yet in open rebellion. They're not yet in open sin here in Ezra, but he's preserving them from that. The way forward is very clear and very hopeful. We treasure God's law word. And we conform ourselves in every sphere to his will. Church, family, government, state, everywhere. We conform ourselves to God's will. We reform where is necessary. We call one another to account where there is sin or malpractice. And we encourage one another to grow in the word. It's so simple. But it's so vital for God's people to remember to do these things. Lest the rot creep in to the, to the church. And brothers and sisters, I feel that we have a tremendous opportunity here at Grace. Not just to do things, but to do really ancient things. To do really old things that God's people have always been doing. To do things that are of eternal consequence. Not just things to make a splash and to look good for a few years and fade away, but things that actually have generational bearing, that bear fruit 
for generations down the road, to be faithful to God's word in the midst of a faithless generation and an often faithless church. Brothers and sisters, we have an opportunity at grace, and the way forward is quite clear. Adherence to God's word and a dependence on him as the king in every facet of our lives. Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's pray. Lord God, I'm so grateful for this passage from Ezra. It is a long time ago, and it is in a land that is far from us. They're speaking different language. They have different customs. And yet, Lord, there is everything that is of substance in this story we can identify with. There is the people of God. There is the good and perfect God of all creation who has called those people to himself. And there is the expression of his will through his law word that he gives to his people for their good and for their flourishing. God, even as Ezra came back and called the people to remember called the people to avoid and flee novelty, called the people to remember the words of God and to anchor themselves in those words, to build their civilization around these words. God, I'm so grateful that this is our call, that you are the same God, that your ways are good, that your law is perfect, and that your people are called to be the vehicle through which you build your kingdom in this world. Lord, you don't need us. You can do all things, and yet you have called us and included us in this task. God, this is joyful news. This is, this is encouraging news. This is a call to which, God, we are insufficient, but you are abundantly sufficient. I pray, Lord, as we think toward implementing these things here at Grace, God, let us be a faithful people. Lord, let us be a faithful people that are faithful to each other to encourage one another in these basic foundational building blocks of our faith. Let us be a faithful people in the midst of a turbulent time and a turbulent culture. Let us be a faithful people that points your people to you and calls all of creation to you. God, we're grateful for Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.